this morning and all the prayer. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We ask you to guide and direct and bless us. Anoint uh, Pastor Adams when he brings the word and have it penetrate our hearts and our lives and to make us more like you. We'll give you the praise as you do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was listening to a, well, just a segue maybe, uh, moving into something here. Uh, Rigo's gone. He went, they left, and him and his family are in Chicago, and then they're going to go, uh, he's still coming back on the 26th, and uh, her parents live across from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan into, uh, which is a lot of different areas, but in one particular area across from Canada, and they're going to stay, have a farm there, or I guess it was a farm one time, and they're going to go up to kids and Kristen stay, but he'll be back on the 26th. On the 27th, the district superintendent will be here, and I would encourage you to be here. I'm thinking about maybe having a potluck, unless he says he really doesn't want to have one, because church ends at uh, noon, well, whenever it ends, probably about noon, and uh, he wants the board to meet at 1.30 to do a pastoral review. I've pastored here for 31 years, and this, uh, this year will be 31 years in September. It's 25 for Don, so I think we're going to probably later on have, we didn't do anything last year, so we'll probably do a 30, the later 30, 25 uh, potluck or something towards the end of summer. That's a milestone. A lot of churches don't have any, any single pastors pastored 25 years, let alone two, let alone two that have pastored in excess of that. So uh, we want to celebrate our milestones too. Uh, I don't know that we have... Uh, Anybody that, except for JD, is is that the older kids, JD, or the younger kids, or all the kids? I'm sorry? Are you teaching the older or younger kids? Oh, the younger ones. Younger ones today. What age is that, pretty much? Nine. Okay. <laughs> it's the ones we don't have here today, but that's all right. <laughs> you know, if, if whatever it is, is what it is. And so we don't have another teacher because we have some stomach flu going around. And we have some people that are sick. And we have people on vacation. Pastor Don and Kathy are at Pacific Beach. And it's over north of Aberdeen area, Ocean Shores, so north of that area. And they're, they're going to be there. They'll be back next week. But uh, how many of, just, just, I'm not trying to put you on the spot or anything else, just trying to get a, raise, a raising. How many think they would be here on the 27th for the service? Uh, this month, the 27th. It's a Sunday service, yeah, morning service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, I'll check and see. I'll call and make sure after this. And if we see that grand five, two people, we might have a potluck. If not, we'll just do it. We'll do it the other way around. How many are going to be able to be at the pastoral meeting? The board meeting? Board members? Yeah, you're well, maybe it's not loud enough. I'm not holding it up far enough. Well, I'm thinking about you know, after at 1 30, the board meets on a 27th for a pastoral review. I just need to know which, how many board members think they can make that meeting. We're going to be in Texas. You're going to be in Texas. That's, that's the type of thing I'm trying to find out because we're getting close to maybe, you know, having a, having a problem. So we might have to reschedule possibly, but I don't want to do that. Um, any other announcements today? <coughs> oh, I guess this is one that a lot of people think is really important. And I do too, but uh, for Father's Day, for ever and ever and ever, we've had pies here. So if you're going to be here on Father's Day, bring a pie. And we let the boldest father choose the pie down to the end. So the pies come back to you usually, in one form or another, right? I mean, you maybe leave an apple and eat a cherry. Yeah. That's what Don's afraid of. He's afraid he's going to get a rhubarb one of these years. But, uh, <laughs> 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 it's one of his recurring fears, Mike. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. So, uh, uh, if you want to play, you want to play a couple songs this morning, or you have a couple you picked out, or you want me to pick them out, or what? We could come to an agreement. All right. What What would that be? Do you have any songs in mind? Who's preaching? Uh, <laughs> I don't know that song. Bandy's <laughs> favorite song. What's your scripture? Yeah, All over the place. <laughs> Does someone have a favorite? You favorite song this world is not my home. This world is not my home. Song. Where was it at? Which where, where is it at? 
that the title? No. Because that's, that's, uh, no, I guess there's one that I'm oh. always raring to hear. Meet Three Kings? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I know that. We're going to wait on that one. We'll call it. <laughs> I, need, I need a score, and this world is not here. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not. Well, I just, Marvin said you, you were wanting to do a play, here. otherwise I wouldn't have called on to. That's okay. Yeah. I'm here. But I'm not brilliant like your retired. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> she not, was stunning. Yeah. So what number, when we, this role is not my home. I don't have that. No, it's not the title, it's got to be something else. Well, why don't we keep looking for the other one, and then we'll start with what our friend we have in Jesus. And, uh, Which is 6.5. Yeah. But you have to sing well, okay? Oh, I, that's, 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 off, that's optional, so. <laughs> well, that means loud. Yes, yeah, okay, that that'll be fine. Won't have a problem.
So in Job, he's talking about his sovereignty. He's talking about his power. In Ezekiel, he's talking about his judgment. In the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about what he expects of us. All different aspects, but just God directly speaking to humans. So I love that because, you know, go to the horse's mouth. Don't ask someone about Adam, just go up and ask Adam. That being said, here's a characteristic that is, I would say, maybe Angus will think of one afterwards, but I would say this characteristic of God is why the gospel is offensive to the world. And it is why you have to start there before the gospel has any meaning, and so you can never have the gospel without it. I'm talking about God's wrath. Wrath. That is anger, but actions done from the anger. Wrath. And this is a hard subject. Because in order to have the gospel, you have to first recognize that there is wrath and you've brought it on yourself. It's always offensive. It will always be offensive. But there are people who try to skate around this. I have some quotes here, just to sort of show you. These are from various teachers who have books, books that are recommended in universities. They have published papers. They have growing churches. They have online ministries. They have many, many people. But let's, let's listen to some of these. Repentance means to accept more of the divine that is already in you. I'll give you a minute with that one. You can run that through your head. Repentance, the term repentance, think of all the times you've seen it in scripture, means to accept the divine that is already in you. That's from a mega church in California. Here's another one. Hell is just a metaphor. It's just a metaphor. It's metaphorical. What is a metaphor? It's drawing a comparison, that's it. It's an illustration. Judgment is not the same as what the church is understanding. It's used merely as an illustration. Run that through your head. Judgment is not the same as the church is understanding. It's merely an illustration. So we have this new, from what the church used to believe, it's just an illustration. That's from a church with in the tens of thousands plus other points. Here's one of my favorites. If God has wrath, he is petty. If God has wrath, then he is petty. And here's probably my second favorite. This comes from a hmm, this comes from a teacher that has books that swept a lot of people up. The God who would accept a virgin sacrifice into a volcano, or who would put his son to die on a pole, is not the Abba of Jesus. I'll read that one more time. The God who would accept a virgin sacrifice into a volcano or put his son to die on a pole is not the Abba of Jesus, is not the Father of Jesus. There's one more that I saw that I didn't record in my notes because I only saw it uh, relatively recently. I saw it last night. And that is, God loves you unconditionally. I give that one half credit. I give that one half credit. But God loves you unconditionally. So here's a question, and I hope this is challenging if you have those, if you listen to those teachers, if you have that belief. First thing I want to ask before we get into this, can God have wrath and anger and not be petty? Can he? And we're going to look, we're going to look at his, what God himself says about this matter. We're going to see what he himself says, because I don't want to give you my opinion. Get me out of here. Let's just look at scripture. Can God be perfect enough to know or is he sovereign enough to know how to deal with sin? Can, can he? Just, just hypothetically. And if not, then who can? So this is why I really like passages where it's God talking to men. So ahead here in Ezekiel 18, there are going to be some things God calls his people out on. In context, he's judging Israel. His people that he redeemed, that he blessed. Some of the things he's going to hold them to account for are just because he told them, don't do it. He said, don't do this. I want you to be different than other people around you. And some of them are sins that we also share, being Gentiles. I'll leave you. You can do your own study on that. That's a really interesting, whole other topic. 18, starting out in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So they're saying everyone is suffering. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord. Anytime you see, declares the Lord. And God's sovereignty, so he's claiming dominion over earth. You pay attention to this. You will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me. 
the parent as well as the child, both alike belong to me. So right there, he has claimed, God is making a claim that every single human being belongs to him. He has ownership. So is God sovereign over people? Well, let's keep going. The one who sins is the one who will die. He does a hypothetical here. Suppose that there is a righteous man who does what is just and right. He doesn't eat at the mountain shrines, meaning he doesn't give homage to idols. He doesn't look at the idols of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. He doesn't have sexual relations with a woman on her period. That's something that God commanded the, Israel, the Hebrews to do for purity. He doesn't oppress anyone. He returns what he took and pledged for a loan. He doesn't commit robbery. He gives his food to the hungry and provides clothing for the naked. He doesn't lend to them at interest. He doesn't take profit from them. So he's generous. He's not robbing people. He's not committing burglary. He's forgiving people who owe him things. He withholds his hand from doing wrong. He judges fairly between two parties. He follows my decrees and faithfully keeps my laws. That man is righteous and he shall surely live, declares the sovereign Lord. So why is God going through this hypothetically? I'm going to pause before you get to the second suppose. In Ezekiel, the priests of the land were doing things in the name of God that were wicked. They were leaders, and you can, do, you can do a really big search on this with the modern church, who claimed the name of God, but they were professing things that God said plainly, that is wrong. Don't do it. One of the things they were doing was they would rob strangers. They would charge interest. They were having idols in the temple. These were all things that God clearly said, these are wrong. And then they had the audacity to say, and we'll see this later, eh, I don't think God's going to be upset or judge us over this. And if he is... You know, our ways, we know better. That was their attitude. We know better than God who said in plain, right, and wrong. So God goes through this, suppose. Suppose there's this righteous man. Here's the second part, verse 10. Suppose he has a violent son who sheds blood or does any of these other things, but the father has done none of them. He eats at the mountain shrine. He defiles his neighbor's wife. He oppresses the poor and the needy. He commits robbery. He doesn't return what he took in pledge. He looks to the idols. He does detestable things. He lends an interest and takes profit. Will such a man live? He will not. Because he's done all of these detestable things, he is to be put to death. And his blood, this is the most offensive part of the gospel, is on his own head. You did this, so you deserve death. That is the offensive part of the gospel. We're going to get there. But suppose, here's another supposition, that this son, so we have a righteous man, a wicked son, now we have the son of the son. He sees all the sins of his father. And though he sees them, he does not do such things. So now we have the grandchild. The grandchild of the righteous man, the son of the wicked man. He does not eat at the mountain shrines. He doesn't look at the idols of Israel, so he's keeping no other gods. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. He does not oppress anyone. He doesn't require a pledge for a loan, meaning he's generous. He does not commit robbery. He gives his food to the hungry. He provides clothing for the naked. He withholds his hand from mistreating the poor. He doesn't take interest or profit from them. He keeps my laws and follows my decree. He will not die for his father's sins. He will surely live. His father will die for his own sin because he practiced extortion. He robbed his brother. He did what was wrong among his people. So here is another claim that people have. Why doesn't God punish your son, your whole family for things. There's actually only one sin that God says he does, which is really people who actively live against him. And I love that. I won't study it today, but I'm just going to throw that out there. If you find it on your own, you can. Because then God's immediate follow-up is, but if they repent, I'm going to bless all the generations. Yet you ask, why doesn't the son share the guilt of the father? Since the son has done what is right and just and has been careful to keep all my decrees, he will surely live. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor the parent the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. So we all get charged based on us, our choices, our actions. And here we go. Here's the next part, 21. Here's the gospel in a nutshell in the Old Testament. And it crops up over and over and over. Here we go. If a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, that person will surely live, and they will not die. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit of my notes. Go out and sin no more. 
That's a very long way of saying, go out and sin no more. When Jesus was short and sweet, he said, go out and sin no more. He said, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Go out and sin no more. That's all that is right there. None of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them. Because the righteous things they have done, they will live. So, very first beginning. All that is to say, he gave a list of things and he says, these are, I hate these things. I hate these sins. And he gives a list because, <laughs> the illustration. Man, the pastor didn't say the thing I'm doing, so he has to go exhaustive because we're humans and we're kind of finicky like that. We'll try to get out of it. And he says, I hate these things, but you do them. And what's worse in this case, these are God's people who know better, and they do them in the name of God. That's really bad. God gets really upset about that. It's going to come up. And so he says, you, later you'll see this, he, he almost is in a courtroom-like setting, and he says, this is what you guys say about me. I'm going to show you why that's not right. But right off the bat, write the gospel. Because of the wicked things you have done, you deserve death. If you are righteous, you would deserve life. Here we are in verse 23. Is God cruel? Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? That's the gospel right there. Do I delight in killing the wicked? No. I'd rather they repent and live. I'd rather they repent and live. Then he goes on. But if a righteous person turns from righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things a wicked person does, would they live? None of the righteous things that person has done would be remembered because they were unfaithful and they are guilty and because of the sins they have committed, they will surely die. So what if you have someone who's upright and then leaves that way and becomes wicked? Well, they're wicked. That's what God's saying there. Yet you say, and here he's addressing the people who are complaining against God, those people earlier I was reading about, these people who complain, could God be just? Could he have wrath? Right now, all that was, I know it was long, that's why I told you where it's at so you could read it, is God outlining what he is judging people for. That's all that was. And saying that I will save the people who repent of this. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. Hear you Israelites, you could insert church, is my way unjust? Is it not your ways that are unjust? If a righteous person turns from righteousness and commits sin, they will die for it. Because of the sin they have committed, they will all die. But if a wicked person turns from the wickedness they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their life. Because they consider all the offenses they have committed and turn from them, that person will surely live. Turning from sin, I'm going I'm to go back to our quote there, repentance. Repentance, you turn from your sin, you repent. Yet you Israelites say the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? We'll see this later in Ezekiel 30, but he says, you say I am not just. Isn't it your ways that are unjust? What did he say they were doing? Oppressing the poor. Stealing from those who are down and out. Committing adultery. Committing murder. Going to the idols, which I'm going to be very succinct with what was happening at the idols. You went to Amon Baal, you went to Molech, you killed your own children. You got drunk and did detestable things of all manner, whether it was anger, whether it was sexual sin. These are all the things the Israelites were doing, and he says, you are saying that I am not just. Because I save the people who repent, and I condemn those that won't. Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent! Turn away from your offenses! Then sin will not be your downfall. One of the things I love about studying God's characters is they don't change. Yes, we had Christ. But even back with Abraham, his righteousness, his faith was righteousness. Here he's calling his people, repent! Repent! Rid yourself of your offenses you committed. Get a new heart and a new spirit. Man, that sounds an awful lot like the call of the gospel today, doesn't it? You mean that even in the Old Testament, God is promising to give them a new heart and a new spirit if they just repent before him? Yeah. Yeah. Almost like before the foundations of the world, the word was slain. Almost like the Lamb of God was there before the foundations of the world, and the salvation story was just wrote out on history. For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord, 
Repent and live. I'm sure some Jewish scribes all just made that up in the 3rd century. Ezekiel 33. And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus have you said, Our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? So he's telling them, go up, go to the royals, tell them this. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So I, I want to be clear on context. This is the second time or third time in the book God's gone to these people. I want the wicked to turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Why? And for you, son of man, say to your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him from his transgressions when he transgresses. As for the wicked of the wicked, he will fall by it, and when he turns from his wickedness, righteousness, he shall be able to live, not by his righteousness when he sins. Confusion. He's just rephrasing what he said earlier. Though I say to the righteous, he would surely live if he trusts in righteousness and does uh, injustice. None of his righteous deeds will be remembered. But in his injustice, that he has done, he shall die. So all he's saying, he's rephrasing. I know that's more confusing. ESV keeps it a little bit tricky. There's some pun there in uh, Hebrew. I encourage you to look it up. There's a pun going on there. Again, though I say to the wicked, you will surely die. If he turns from his sin and does what is just and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he took with robbery, walks in the statutes of life, not doing injustice, he'll surely live and not die. None of his sins will be remembered against him. He has done what is just and right, and he shall surely live. So again, God is saying again, I still will save you if you turn from your wickedness. Make amends. Repent. Yet your people say the way of the Lord is not just when it is their own way that is not just. When the righteous turns from righteousness and does injustice, he'll die for it. When the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he'll live by this. Yet you say, I'm not judged, or not just, O house of Israel. I will judge each of you according to your ways. So the whole point of that, why did I go through a whole bunch of Ezekiel right there? God is making the case that his wrath is fair. That is what God is making the case there. So we're going to get to God's sovereignty. We're going to get to the idea that God doesn't sin in his wrath, and we'll see why. But the whole point of those two verses, those two passages is that God's wrath is fair. What's happening right there? First, God is warning the people. Right? God's warning the people. He's saying that if you'll but repent, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit and make it possible for you to be righteous. He's saying that I will not remember what you have done against you if you'll only turn from this sin. And I really love the part up here in verse 11 where it says, Why will you die? Why? Because he's warning you. He's saying at this point this leads to death and you're still going to die? It's kind of like, uh, I remember when my dad tells a story about when my brother Josh was a kid and he saw a glowing heart hot uh, oven top. That says, don't touch that, it's hot. What does he do? I didn't believe you, I touched it. Why would you touch it? I told you it was hot. It's the exact same thing going on there. Why will you die, O house of Israel? What's the purpose? Why do people cling to their sin? That's something between them and God, honestly. But why? I sometimes wonder that. Why? You have the Holy Spirit that convicts you. You have God in history. You have God, one of my favorite quotes about science, a lot of the founding fathers of science have really good quotes like this. One of my favorite is, a little bit of science leads you away from God and a lot takes you right back to him. Why would you die in your sin? So God is saying, my wrath is fair, though. When someone who was righteous becomes wicked, I have to judge them for it. I have to. I don't delight in it, but I have to. When someone who was wicked repents and seeks me, I'll save them. Very, that's the gospel right in the Old Testament. That is the gospel in the Old Testament done through the saving power of Christ right there. And God laments over the people he has to judge. Now here's the difference between could God have wrath and be petty. Because I'm addressing multiple things. This isn't a by all means, this isn't the whole story. I could do a longer study on this. But one of the accusations against God is that he'd be petty. I would be. I would be. I'm not going to lie. I would delight in killing the wicked. If it were me. I'm not God. I'll admit to that. I would be petty about it. 
God is looking at the people he's judging and saying, you brought this on yourself, and look what I did for you. I humbled myself. I gave up all the names I had. I died for you. I cared enough to minister to you every minute of your waking life. Why will you die? Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3. Skip ahead to the New Testament. Lest I spend too long in the Old Testament, which is probably like my third favorite area of study is Christ and the salvation story in the Old Testament. Because I got news for you, you can't, you can't even read the book of Proverbs without seeing Jesus pop up. It's just, it's just there. It's everywhere. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written them both as reminders to stimulate you into wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given to our Lord and Savior through your apostles. So he's saying there were words spoken in the past by the prophets, Old Testament, and the apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. Now, a lot of people will stop there. We're not stopping with here. We're going to go through this whole thing. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. For ever since our ancestors die, everything goes on and on and on as it has since the beginning of creation. They deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, at also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So now here's a claim. There's a claim that God has judged the world, the physical, the finite, and that he will do it again. And that he will do it again. Now, one of two things has to happen here if we're still under the assumption that God can't have wrath. Did God really cause the flood, or is that a metaphor? Don't go that far, it's a metaphor. Or, is there no judgment coming in the future? Now, lest I be accused of reading my opinion in there, that seems pretty open and shut to me. I've been accused of doing that. I strive not to. Case in point, the Bible has changed my mind on at least two major issues in my life recently. Different conversation. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. And I'm going to tell you this right here, just for looking into my life. This passage is a very... I go back to this passage a lot. Because in my heart and life, I believe, God, why do you let people blaspheme your name? Why do you let people harm their neighbor? Why, O oh Lord, who plays with the nations, do you let things like this happen? With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, not as some understand slowness, but he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So there's another claim about God's wrath. He's patient. He's patient. He's going to give you every opportunity that he can physically give you to accept him, to repent, to turn from your sin and live. Why will you die, O Israel? Why will you die? But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed with fire, and the earth and everything done on it will be laid bare. So suddenly, the Lord is going to come back. That's what's happening here. Since everything will be destroyed this way, so with that in mind, here's Christians, how do we live knowing that God's wrath is coming? What kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Have a new heart and a new spirit. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, and there's a whole other sermon about what we can do that increases God coming back. That day will bring about destruction of the heavens by fire, the elements will melt in the heat, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. So, dear friends, since we look forward to this, make every effort to be spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul wrote to you with wisdom that God gave him. And I love this last little bit. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort. <clears throat> There's a lot of ministries I could mention on that one. 
as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. So here he's saying, yeah, okay, there's some complicated things in Paul and some other parts of the Bible which people twist to meet their own things, like, I don't know, uh, God's judgment is an illustration, an illusion, hell's a metaphor, God would never demand any punishment of your sins, he loves you unconditionally, repentance means to accept the divinity already within you. That's some twisting of scripture. That's some twisting of scripture. I just encourage you to read the Bible. Don't read your own views onto it and see what happens. Therefore, dear friends, since you are forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Okay, here's the next big idea. Moving on, I just want to preface this. What if... Man, it's, it's hard to even think about this because I know, like, whoa, it's hard to even phrase this. There is a belief that is growing in our country that the revelations of God, and I'm already on shaky ground here because, like, you've got to believe you're getting progressively more revealed, that there are conflicting views, and it's basically all of this conflicting from people, and where they go with this view is that Jesus is the only way to read all of Scripture, which sounds fine. Don't get me wrong, I love looking for Jesus in all the scripture, because the, what did Jesus say? All scripture points to me, and if you knew that, you would see, see me when you seek it. Okay, but, therefore, if we look at Jesus, say, on the Sermon on the Mount or whatever, we can just throw out any teaching of hell, judgment, wrath, anger, anything we don't like, we can take Jesus and throw it out. I have some problems with this, because one of my favorite things to point out is that, I don't know how you come to this view without realizing this, Jesus talks more about hell than he does about heaven. He talks more about judgment than he does about heaven. The only thing he talks about more is actual salvation, is actual calls to him. But they try to get rid of this view, and they try to say, well, because Jesus is not wrathful, and Jesus is God, or they try to distort the Trinity and say that they're separate, therefore there is no wrath. The thing, I, the thing that gets me about this is Jesus himself owns, he owns, he embodies the portrait of a judging Messiah of a Messiah that sits in judgment and that has wrath, but also has mercy. Also has mercy. You can't have one without the other, not in serve the God of the Bible. Mercy is important. Love is important. But without mercy and love, or I should say without judgment, what do those matter? What does those matter? Can we just be wicked and live? There's all kinds of questions that come up here. But this is serious doctrine that I've spent hours listening to them preach from many different mega churches. And they say, it sounds really good on the surface, and then you dig into what they're actually claiming about God. So here's just Jesus. Just Jesus' own word. Get Adam out of the way. Just Jesus. So here's in Luke 13. Luke 13. Now there was some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So they were offering profane sacrifices. That's the thought. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Gentiles because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent... Oh, I wonder if the God-man who speaks with the authority of Jesus Christ and God and the Spirit will possibly sound like God in the rest of the Bible. I don't know, I guess maybe it'll sound different. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. How about those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. I, I, I thought that, 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 that there was no judgment and that Jesus didn't talk like that. Then he told a parable. If a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it but did not find any, so he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. It shouldn't use up the soil. Well, that sounds an awful lot like, I don't know, if you're righteous and then you turn from righteousness and you do wickedness, you'll be judged? I don't know. Sir, the man replied, let it alone for one more year and I'll dig around and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. I don't know. Personally, that sounds a lot like Jesus pleading with God to give us a little bit more time to find repentance. You take that as you will. That's a parable. You take that as you will. It's supposed to be confusing. Matthew 12. I really love Matthew here. 
<laughs> We're going to be in Matthew 12, verse 33. This is why I told you there's a whole bunch. We'll be in John 12 and Matthew 15 next. So I don't know if you guys want to get there. It's up to you. Here's Jesus again. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. So what you yield, that's what you're known for. He's talking to the Pharisees here. I didn't know Jesus sounded like this. You brood of vipers! Oh, that's a little upsetting. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil, meaning your words are what's in your heart. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. And for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So there's Jesus not only saying that he believes in the day of judgment, but that you're going to be judged for every single careless word you speak. Well, I didn't know that Jesus talked about judgment. John 12, 44. Jesus cried aloud and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but him who sent me. Whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into this world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him. The word of God itself will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. There's another claim. God's making claims about his wrath. Jesus is saying, I came to testify to God's commandment, which is that you should have eternal life. And if you deny me, my purpose was to come and to save you. The word of God itself will be used to judge you. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm making that up. Maybe I'm reading too much into that. Let's go on to Matthew 15. Let's see if there's something else Jesus says about judgment. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You've received without pain, so give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, no two tunics or sandals or a staff, but the laborer deserves his food. And whenever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it, if the house is worthy. Let your peace come upon it, but if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off your dust from your feet and leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Really? Really, Jesus, if they don't listen to your disciples who come bearing the good news, it's better for Sodom and Gomorrah? You can do your own study as to why Jesus would say that, but long story short, Sodom and Gomorrah didn't get someone showing up with that message. John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. There's that believe in God and repent nonsense again, saying that you'll be delivered from death and into life. So here's the big idea. Why did I throw a whole bunch of scripture at you? Why did we go Old Testament, New Testament, and Jesus himself? God has judgment. He has wrath. He carries out the wrath on the wicked. He condemns the sin that we choose to do. It's not that we're condemned for existing as flawed creation. We're condemned because we choose to do evil. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. And people lose their mind with this, but why does God say, for example, that children are innocent blood? When I hold a newborn babe, what sin has it done against me? And I think of it like this. This is an easy way I think of it. I'm not saying this is a theological word that you have to burn under your heart. But if the law of God is to love your neighbor as yourself, then surely sin is sinning against your neighbor. Why would God, on one hand, say all of sin, which is true, that's why we all need a Messiah, we're all fallible, our nature is wicked, but why would God consider a child to be innocent? When, when did a baby look at me and go, you know, I'm going to steal from Adam? 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna stab Adam with his knife and kill him because I hate him. Baby doesn't think like that. There'll be a time in that child's life when he does, and then he's accountable. And then he's accountable. That's where age of accountability comes in. Again, I could do a whole other sermon on that. The idea is that God declares that he is sovereign. He made that claim in the beginning. Every single human being belongs to me. Some people ask, I saw this, I had this discussion this week, what do you think about God commanding some people to be killed? I say, yeah, the main idea is that that's God. And if he really owns everyone, then he could kill me right now. And in a way, he does when I die. I'm okay with that. He's sovereign. It's, it's his. And if you don't like it, what are you going to do? I have, a, I have a co-worker who's not a Christian, but he gets a chuckle out of these kind of discussions. And he said, what are they going to do? Are they going to shake their fist at God and be like, oh, you can't do this to me? No, God will just be like, you're dead. Yeah, I said the Tower of Babel always brings me chuckling because in other writings, they said that they were trying to wage war with God. And I'm like, what, are you going to shoot arrows into the heavens? No. God is sovereign, and he declares himself to be sovereign. God's judgment is perfect because he sees the hearts of men. He sees that your motivation was selfish and wicked and hurt someone else. He doesn't just make up something arbitrary. Then the Lord is patient. He always is warning. He sends prophets, signs and miracles. He convicts the world of sin personally with the Holy Spirit. What more do you want the man to do? Come down in front of you and live out a Christian? Oh, wait, he did that with Jesus. What do you want God to do? Like, that's, the, that's why will you die, O oh Israel. But here's the thing. This is why people cling to this. If there is no wrath and judgment, then sin is sin's not that big of a deal, is it? It's an imperfection you have. Yeah, you get kind of messed up. We call it a little mistake. Like, okay, a little mistake is when I add, like, salt instead of sugar to my coffee. Right? Not when I run someone over and murder them so I can get with their wife. I'm just calling a spade a spade here. Okay? Little mistakes. No. Sin is willful. You willfully go against God. So sin is this very big deal that God is going to judge. I think of Isaiah standing before the living God. Woe is me, even though he's the chosen prophet of God, and he feels like he's going to be struck dead just for seeing what he's seeing. But despite that, God still will have mercy on you. He still died for you, and he still wants to redeem you from your sin. And, if we're going to talk about free will, he respects your free will enough to have your word be the final say. That's a bitter pill to swallow. If you spend your entire... I've done it like this. My beautiful fiancé, Mandy. If we meet and she is not interested in, in, in me at all, and she tells me over and over and over, I send her flowers, she throws them in the garbage. I call her, she blocks me. She gets her restraining order with the cops. I try over and over and over. I'm always calling her, always constantly. And then one day I go, okay, you know what? She's going to have a better life with me. I can guarantee it. She's going to have like all of her needs met. So I hit her on the head and I throw her in my basement. And she has a perfectly comfortable life in the basement. That's what I think of if God were to force you to be in heaven when you spend your entire existence saying no. He, approach, he approaches you softly with a, a letter. No, God. He approaches you firmly by showing up at your place of work and says, here I am. No. Your family members come by and go, dude, this guy's really a great guy. You should talk to him. No. Nope. He says, but I can save you. You're going to die. No. Nope. Would, would you rather he hit you on the head and throw you in there? So whenever people bring up free will with hell, it's like, how can God send you to hell? I'm like, you send yourself there. Why will you die, O Israel? Why will you die? So here we go to Job. Job 40, verse 2. I'll let you get there. Because I really enjoy this passage. Again, like we saw in Ezekiel, like we saw with Jesus and Matthew, like we'll see in Job. I love these passages where it's just God plainly talking to men. You don't have to give me that, well, maybe it was Jeremiah with his opinion. No, this is just God direct to men. I really love this passage. Because at the end of the day, people give all of these arguments, free will, pettiness, does there have to be an atonement on the cross? Is your sin really that big of a deal? I don't know, could God sin in his anger? That's one I hear all the time, too. What about when God flooded the world? What about if God were to send a meteor right now and wipe us all out in Yakima, Washington? Which I'm fine with God's judgment sorting us out because he's God. But I hear all these arguments, but this is what it boils down to. So, <laughs> God, right in his beginning when he lays into Job. I really love this passage. I really love Job. 
Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Again, Job 40, verse 2. Then Job answered, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I say to you? I will lay my hand on my mouth. I've spoken once and I'll not answer. I'll not answer twice, but I'll proceed no further. So what has happened? Job was questioning everything. He begins questioning God. His friends were mocking Job for what's going on in life. And now God has shown up like a whirlwind. This is as close to the judgment scene as I think most people in the Bible have gotten. Standing before the actual living God. This is about as close as anyone's ever gotten. And I really love God's tone here. Dress for action like a man. Put your big boy pants on, Job. I will question you, and you'll make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you might be right? Do you have an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Keep in mind, he's a whirlwind right now. Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger. And look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. I love that so much. Because what is God saying? God is saying, you think you have it all figured out? You think you're so perfect? Can you condemn me so that you're right? I think back to the sermon on the Holy Spirit, the spirit of error, the spirit of Antichrist. Okay, so you're right and I'm wrong. Prove it. Contest me. Adorn yourself with majesty and glory and dignity. Clothe yourself with splendor. Let your anger pour out. Look on everyone who is proud. That means you can see into men's hearts. You humble them. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Bring justice, in other words. It's one of the things God is a obsessive about his justice. That's the real issue with God's wrath. It's not that the Bible isn't clear on it. It's not that God isn't perfect in doling out justice and wrath, that he gives people time. It's not that God doesn't clearly say what he's against or what he's for. He's for life. He's against you hurting other people. It's not that God doesn't give you an easy way, literally the easiest way I could think of, just repent and be sincere and I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. It's not that he didn't make the way. It's that you want to be right and you want to be God in your heart. And you can't. And you can't. But if you could, maybe I'd acknowledge that by your own power you could save yourself. That's why the gospel is offensive. Because there is no hope of deliverance if there's nothing to be delivered from. There is no perfect and just God if he doesn't ever punish wickedness. There is no saving and redeeming power if there's no sin to be saved and redeemed from, and then everything is meaningless. It's meaningless if I go out and commit a genocide, because who really cares? That is the problem. But why will you die, O Israel? Why? I've made it clear. I've made it abundantly clear to you. I'm telling you this is how judgment is. One day, my patience will be gone. You'll seek the Lord, and he won't be found. Why will you die? Pride. We don't want to give up our sin. We want to be right. There's some issue that we can't let go of. I'd be saved, but I'd have to forgive him. I'd be saved, but I'd have to give up this money. I'd be saved, but I'd have to admit that I was wrong. I'd be saved, but it would cost me too much. Jesus tells you to consider the cost. So the issue I have when people throw out God's wrath, and the only reason I'm preaching this today is because you'll see it. It's becoming more and more mainstream. And if you don't, praise God, you don't run into it, but the rest of us will see it. I'll see it again in my lifetime. I've already seen it three times this week on three different conversations. It still boils down to a sin issue and you shall want to be as gods. I've given you the plan. I've given you the purpose. Later in Job, what does God tell Job? I'll give you a new heart. Not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. 
I'll give you my spirit. It's pretty open and shut. But that is the most uncomfortable, I would say, characteristic of God that people want to reject. Right there. Everybody loves the idea that God is all love. That he has no justice. That he's all peace. Well, that he never wrecks the, the evil nations. Anyway, so I, I hope that this has been a possibly a challenging passage for you, a challenging scripture. If it is, awesome. I'd love to do a more on this. This is just like grazing the surface of one of God's major characteristics, that he is wrathful, angry, and perfect. The idea that God can see the hearts of men and judges you on that heart, I kind of think the opposite of what was going on with David, right? David was the anointed, the rest of them didn't, didn't have it. Maybe this is just sort of a, recur, uh, a reminder. I like to think for Christians that this is more of a reminder and maybe gives us some urgency to go out and witness to people. For the wicked, though, this is the beginning of the gospel. This is the key central point that God, and this is going to be controversial, so I'll end on this and then I'll pray and then I'll run out of here before you guys hit me with your cars. The idea that God hates wickedness and he hates you for practicing wickedness, but he loves you enough to die, to redeem you, to humble himself to the lowest of the low, so you cannot be like that anymore. Amen. Amen. And I think that's an encouraging thought. Let's end in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you that you do have perfect wrath and judgment, that you will make things right, that you give us the chance to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And I thank you, Lord, that we can truly be a new creation in you. That we can get a new spirit and a new heart. And Lord, that we can walk after your ways. And Lord, ultimately, Lord, I just thank you that you don't ask that much of us. You do, but you make it easy to do. So Lord, I pray that you'd be with each and every one of us here. And that we have that sense of urgency that one day, one day it will be too late for us to share. Lord, I pray that you give us that person in our life that needs to hear just a little bit about you. And that you give us that spirit-led drive to speak to them. And Lord, that we just let speak through us. Give us the chance to witness for you. You said that there's a plentiful harvest, not enough workers. Lord, let us each be a worker in our week. Lord, I pray for anyone who is sick and needs healing, anyone who needs the spirit in their life, Lord, speak through them. Speak through them with your word. Lord, speak with them through who you are and the world around them, and send them something in their life to encourage them. I pray this in Jesus' name, and in the name of the Spirit, and in the name of the Father, amen. 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 You were dismissed. What? Oh, yeah, Angus, where are you going? It's your birthday. Get up here and get sung to. Get sung to. That's right. You know, I would have forgot, but she told me, it's his birthday. It is my birthday. It's his birthday. It is. Let's sing happy birthday to Angus. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you.